We have, yep. well, actually, okay. So welcome. Uh, this is the, our first ever <laughs> gathering of um, people who have said that they would like to be facilitators from the uh, Facebook, uh, Empathy Ten Facebook group. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. Um, you know, the purpose of the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy and this, the purpose for the Empathy Tent work and the Empathy Circle work really is to try to create more understanding uh, and connection in the world so that people can resolve their differences peacefully. Uh, that's our purpose. That's the larger purpose. Um, and we invite people into Empathy Circles in that spirit. And we, you know, if you all are going to be facilitators, that is a, when I first started this, I wasn't really conscious of, you know, that setting that intention, like stating that intention that our, our, we are coming together to listen to each other, to create more understanding and to, so that we can see each other more as human beings. Uh, and that that's not a solution to problems, but it's a important first step in a solution to problems. And so setting that intention, that that's why we're there listening to each other and speaking to each other. Uh, that's an important first step in the circle that I wasn't aware of, the important facilitation. So, um, uh, so thank you all for being here. And I thought, uh, Edwin and I thought that we should um, start with some introductions. Is there anything you want to say, Edwin, before we do introductions? Uh, yeah, you said the overall intention, the intention for this circle specifically is uh, for becoming an empathy circle participant, uh, co-facilitator and facilitator. So that's what we want to uh, look at, I mean, explore here. Yep, that's about it. Okay, so, so let's do introductions. and. Uh, and so take about a minute and introduce uh, maybe a little bit about yourself and um, where you're from and uh, where you are in the political spectrum and where you would like and why you want, why you would like to be an empathy tent, uh, an empathy circle facilitator. And I'll, I'll start, I'll model it by starting. So I'm Lou Zwire. I'm from Petaluma, California. Uh, I am liberal slash progressive, I'd say, although I don't really have a strong identity that way. I, I'm actually, I think of myself as a very fair-minded person and I'm open to arguments from all sides of the spectrum. Sometimes I get myself in trouble because I'm listening actually to and considering <laughs> uh, positions that are like on the right or, or that are conservative and um, they'll, they'll get mad at me for that. Um, and then I want to be an empathy. I do empathy circles and I do this work with Edwin uh, because we need to dialogue more. People need to understand each other. And a lot of the problem, my perception is a lot of the problems we have right now is because people are just not listening to each other and understanding each other. They're not seeing each other as people. They see each other as positions or icons of certain kinds of representatives. Anyway, so that's me. And I'll go. Uh, Edwin Rutsch. Uh founder of the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy in the Empathy Tent, and I'm here in El Cerrito, uh, California, which is just north of Berkeley in the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, politically, I grew up conservative in the Central Valley here, <clears throat> evangelical, fundamentalist, conservative, mm -hmm. did a lot of traveling, uh, kind of moved to more the progressive side. Uh, politically, and now kind of just seeing that there's a, a third side, the empathy side, which is listening to all sides and bringing all sides together. And so that's uh, sort of my focus uh, in politically. And I, I have just found that empathy and empathy circles, this practice that we're doing here, is one of the easiest, quickest gateway practices to fostering empathy for personal support, for personal growth, and especially for conflict <clears throat> mediation, so between the political left and right especially. So um, I'm really wanting to spread uh, empathy uh, practice as widely as possible. So that's me, thanks. <clears throat> and if you're not speaking, it's good to mute just for uh, this little mute button in the lower left-hand corner. So Evan, you wanna go next? Sure, um, Evan Magor uh, from Long Island, New York. Um, grew up liberal and then probably became more liberal in college 
Um, and now uh, in the past few years, I've been studying uh, nonviolent communication. It's working really well in my personal romantic relationship. So I don't see why it couldn't work politically across the country. Um, and yeah, just, I, I very much identify with how Edwin says it's sort of choosing the third side, which is empathy, bringing everyone together. Thank you. Art, you want to go next? Sure, thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Art Burns. I'm in uh, Denver, Colorado. Um, I, uh, on a political spectrum, I, uh, I'm very much, uh, I, I believe in balance as well. Uh, I, I identify mostly progressive in my ideas, but I, I try to really understand the, uh, the other side and I try to listen and I try to, uh, you know, I try to show empathy basically. Um, and I'm interested in, in learning more about this process because uh, in my work, I, I do uh, mindfulness coaching. And, and one of the things that I work with is, is empathy. You know, we do it via, you know, sort of one-on-one -on -one, uh, um, active listening exercises and stuff. And so this just seems like bringing that to a, a more uh, larger scale. And that I think is very, very important in the world today is, has been already articulated. Um, so, and I wanted to say I'm very uh, thankful for being here with you all. Thank you, Lewis. You want to go next? Sure. Hi, I'm Lewis <clears throat> Griggs, and I'm living now in Berkeley, California. I've been in the Bay Area about 40 years. I grew up in Minnesota. I was educated in New England. Um, I was raised pretty conservative, a registered Republican, and yet I also helped start the diversity training movement in the U.S. about 30, 40 years ago because of my own white male ethnocentrism, I knew I was the one who needed the work and thought I wasn't the only one. So I still do that work. And, and in that process, for me, it's all connected to how I've studied politics all my life and went into it twice and left because of the lack of ethics in it too often. And I'm one of those weird people who believe so much in the democracy. I love the intelligence on the right and the intelligence on the left. I can't stand the righteousness on either the left or the right. Just the, and the balance. And so, yeah, I voted, I'm a centrist. I'm far right on pretty much economic issues. I'm a Stanford MBA and I'm as far left on human rights issues. So I voted once for Obama and once for Romney. And here I am. I live with the diversity within myself every day. Thank That's you. All. Bill, you want to go? Uh, my name is Bill Filler. I live here in Richmond, California. I've been involved with the Empathy Tent for, I guess, about six months or so, um, maybe a little bit more. Um, and I've gone to several uh, protests and things like that. Um, the reason that I'm getting involved, I'm, oh, by the way, I'm a retired special education teacher. So I had a very intense class um, on the edge of uh, needing hospitalization. So those, that, um, that experience brought the issue of empathy and how to create it, it made it very, very um, uh, important because if I didn't uh, get through to my students, I got hit. Um, so there was, there was a very uh, immediate feedback system. Um, and, uh, and what I like about this particular and circles is that it's taking um, uh, the idea of empathy, but also, uh, connecting with each other and really understanding each other out of exclusively the realm of therapy. I'm not against therapy, but into the general domain. And we say to the people, you can do this. This is a, your birthright. And so I think that the circle combines, yes, it is a method that you use, but it needs the input of each individual. So as each individual participates in it, they get their own unique experience which then builds towards community. And that's been my experience. So I'm good. Thank you, Bill. Rick, you want to go next? You got to unmute yourself. Aha, now I have sound. Um, yes, my name is Rick and I'm here in New Haven, Connecticut. I am from New York. I'm here on kind of an experiment of uh, where I'm trying to launch the storytelling project, which brings people into these kinds of circles also. Um, let's see, my position um, 
as we're talking, I was just thinking um, of when Occupy happened, how, how I wanted to go there and I went there and participated, but where I wanted to be was around the empathy tent because there's energy, the energy is different, you know? So my political positions are lean towards kind of Bernie Sanders kind of, kind of ways of thinking, but really that's just that I want to see the world um, work for everyone. I want, I want abundance for everyone and, and well-being for everyone. And that is just the strategy that I see. And I'm very open to, to listening and connecting. And I think that's the most important thing. So that's why I'm here to spread this. So thank you. Great, thank you. Martin, you wanna go next? Okay, yes, my, my name is Martin. I'm Martin Golda. I'm, I'm in Victoria, British Columbia. Um, although I was born in the UK and I had my empathy surgically removed in British boarding school. <laughs> and uh, then I, my career was as an architect, but I became uh, a mediator for about the last 20 years of that uh, alongside the architecture and uh, found I really enjoyed it and uh, I was quite good at it. So I, uh, I kind of developed that side of the business and kept that going after I retired as an architect. Um, I uh, went on about a 15 year quest to track down this thing called empathy, uh, of which I had none. And um, uh, fairly, uh, fairly successfully, I think, I, I still, my mentor told me I should write a book called Mechanical Empathy. Um, which is a bit like uh, I was impressed with uh, uh, Edwin's um, interview with Sam uh, Vankin where he talked about um, a cold empathy that he could switch on and off with the flick of a switch. And, uh, and I find I still do that in situations where I'm not feeling very empathetic. Uh, I, I can um, switch it on and I find fake it till you make it does in fact then draw you towards the real thing. Um, so, uh, I have actually now, uh, traveled in Europe quite a bit and spoke at a number of conferences on empathy. Mm -hmm. So I must've learned something, I guess. So <laughs> here we are. I've always been an admirer and follower of Edwin's work. Thank you, Martin. Todd. Well, hi, I'm Todd Porter and I'm in Grapevine, Texas, which is near Dallas, Fort Worth. And I... Politically, I'm probably mostly on the left, but like uh, Rick was talking about, my objective is for everybody to thrive. And so I'm, I'm for that. Whoever's doing something that helps people thrive, I'm for that. Um, at the same time, I know, uh, have learned repeatedly in a bunch of different ways, whatever position I'm totally convinced of, there's a piece of the puzzle that's missing. And so unless I know how to listen to the folks that disagree with me, I'm the best I can do is get part of the part of the solution or part of the answer. And so um, just from a finding the best option, the best plan, the best path, I want to know what people I disagree with have to say. And then like others have said here, I'm convinced that our country will destroy itself if we don't as a, as a nation learn how to do this effectively. And so I'm here, to learn how to do it better. Thank you so much. Mark. Hi, everyone. How do I switch over? I don't, I'm, I'm new to Zoom. Do you all see me? Uh, yeah, actually, so for anyone that doesn't know, there's a button in the upper uh, right-hand corner of your screen that says either speaker view or gallery view. And if it says, if it says, gallery view, if you click it, you will see a miniature for each person who's in the room. Um, if you, that's the way I prefer to look at it because it's kind of like being in a meeting, I can see everybody. So if you're not seeing a little miniature of everyone, you might try clicking gallery view. Okay, yeah, it's just showing me like whoever's speaking. So okay. um, I'll let y'all know, I, uh, I actually in high school, I, I was in college, I, I was a big um, speech and debate uh, player and I competed and I was very um, involved in that and kind of gained a, a sense of who I am from it. Um, and I found that that uh, was, was helpful in winning, but it wasn't really helpful in understanding. Uh, and, um, and then I began studying psychology and communication 
uh, and I was working with children for a while, emotionally disturbed. Um, and learning a lot about how to kind of communicate with them in, in non-threatening um, and more understanding ways. And I think, um, I think I was actually a little predisposed to that. I tend to think about what other people want before myself, um, which I think has, you know, y'all might be familiar with that. It's a, it's a bit of a curse too, because we often forget about ourselves in the whole process. Um, but I'm, I'm very much embracing this now uh, more than ever because of the politics. I've been moderating and mediating um, online for a decade now and um, trying to sort of find a center and trying to find a way for people to communicate their concerns uh, the best I can without being an authority who's telling everyone what to do. Um, and so I'm very much excited about, you know, getting to learn from the rest of you. It sounds like you all have a lot of experience in this area. So. I'm in San Francisco, by the way. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. That is everyone, right? Everyone got to share? Um, I, I'm just so moved <laughs> already <laughs> listening to all of you, uh, your experience, and actually just the way you express yourselves, your desire for understanding and connection and your excitement about finding ways to do more of that and the positive impact that that might have on the world. Um, I already feel very connected to all of you and, and, uh, and grateful that you're here. And um, yeah, so I'm just, I'm feeling that actually very strongly right now. Um, you know, so Edwin and I did do a little bit of planning for this session and uh, we are, you know, we went to Politicon in October and we had the empathy tent there and we held a lot of circles, <laughs> uh, some of which were very contentious some less so, um, but a lot of good right-left dialogue and a lot of people, we, one of the things we asked people to do there was sign up for doing online circles after Politicon and, um, and if people wanted to be facilitators. And then Edwin created the Facebook group uh, for this and invited people to join there. So some, I don't know if any of you were, was anyone at Politicon? No, okay. So, 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 oh, well, yeah, Bill was, he's part of the team that went. Um, yeah, so you all have come through the Facebook group. So, you know, we are interested, we're very interested in, uh, the, well, the work of the Empathy Tent up till this point has been primarily to go to rallies, you know, public rallies and put up the tent and create a space for structured dialogue where people can really hear each other rather than what typically happens at the rally, which is, both sides are there or multiple sides are there and they're all screaming at the same time. They're all talking. Everybody's talking. Nobody's listening. <laughs> so we're trying to provide, we're trying to provide an alternative to that uh, to create some kind of real political dialogue. And actually we had a lot of success with that, but we also think that doing circles online is an easy way for people from different perspectives, different, different um, places physically to come together to do dialogue that also can be easily recorded, like we're recording this. And then that those dialogues can be put out into the world for people's learning and reflection and to see how the process works and to also hear alternative perspectives. So one of the things we came away from in Politicon was really wanting to promote online circles. And I'm thinking this through while I'm saying it. So, and our interest in, in helping people understand how to facilitate circles is not only to do it online. We do want to do it online. Definitely would like to do that. We hope that you will want to do that. But we're also interested in people taking this process and facilitating circles wherever they want. Um, and one of the things that Bill said, which is true for me too, one of the things that really attracted me to this process is that it is very simple. I have a long background in nonviolent communication and teaching people conflict resolution and communication skills. And I have tried lots of different ways of teaching people, you know, that practice or similar practices. And one of the things I love about the empathy circle is that the little bit of structure that it contains makes it so that you actually don't have to train people at all. Um, they can just, they have their little bit of time. They can speak. Uh, we don't try to control their speaking at all. 
uh, which is, that's one of the great lessons I learned in trying to teach NVC is that it's really more about trying to teach people how to listen differently than about how to speak differently. Because uh, you really, it's, you can't really control how people speak. Or if you do, it just kind of shuts them down. Uh, and so, um, yeah, so, you know, we, we actually, and in the empathy circle, we don't really teach people how to listen. We just ask them to reflect by what they're hearing. And the moderator or the circle facilitator usually does the first reflection as a way of demonstrating what reflection is. Um, uh, and then people do that at whatever level they can. Some people can't do it all and the facilitator helps them. Uh, some people do it but add their own judgments and that's also where facilitation involves kind of helping people to understand the process helping them to do the process, stepping in when they can't do the process. Um, uh, those are some of the aspects of being a, being a facilitator. S something else that's different, this is really different about the empathy circle process, is that everyone in the empathy circle is a participant, including the facilitator. So the facilitator takes a turn and they say whatever they want to when it's their turn. They could. And, and that is an equalizer. It kind of puts everyone on the same level. And so what we call a facilitator really is just a person in the circle that has more experience in the circle maybe than others. And so they can help hold the process with a little bit more intention. I mean, it's everyone's job in the circle to help hold the process and everyone gets a sheet. So that everyone knows what the process is. It's not secret. Not only the facilitator knows the process. So everyone gets a sheet and everyone can, the sheet's fairly simple. The process is fairly simple. So everyone can help hold it. But it does, it does make a difference when you have one, someone in the circle who has a lot of, commu you know, who has some communication skills or who has a lot of experience with being in, a, being in the circle and they can help people along with, you know, if they're having trouble holding the process or, during the reflection. So I've talked a lot. Edwin, do you want to? Is there yeah, any the, I would say we're, what we're trying to do is scale up. So uh, we have, you know, several facilitators right now. We'd like to get, you know, 10, 20, 100, 1,000, couple thousand, you know, yay, I see it. <laughs> uh, you know, scale up so we can, you know, take this, eventually take it to the halls of Congress, say, we want you to take part in empathy circles or else, you know. So I see it as, as sort of scaling up to that. And uh, I did create an event for Sacramento, an Occupy Empathy on the Capitol steps, that we're going to advocate for the California state representatives to have empathy circles. And I, I created the event uh, in uh, May, so we'll see. But anyway, we're trying to we're trying to gear up to to you know spread how to do empathy circles, and we're still trying to figure it out. You know, we don't have a pat structure you know set up yet. But the main thing is is it's experiential. Like you know, right now we're explaining a lot, but uh, the circle itself is you know you get in there, you just do it, and you learn by doing. It's not like you're going to take a big long class you know, six month class. This is like, you just get in there and you kind of learn by, by <clears throat> doing it. So I think that's kind of like, yeah. And then the steps, I would say the steps that we have identified so far, and again, it's not like we have worked this out. This is the first time we're doing it. The steps we've identified so far is, you know, the first step would be participating in a bunch of empathy circles, probably at least six, I would say. And getting, getting, so, so you understand the process from experiential uh, point of view. Um, the next step would be, you know, uh, being a co-facilitator in a circle. Uh, and the co-facilitator usually ke helps keep time. Uh, and I mean, facilitator and co-facilitator, it's up to the two of them to decide how they're gonna split up responsibilities and how they're gonna co-facilitate. Um, Sometimes the co-facilitator doesn't participate in the circle. They just keep time. Sometimes the co-facilitator and facilitator switch off sharing in the circle. Um, a lot of times a, a circle is facilitated by one person without a co-facilitator. So it just depends. You don't have to have a co-facilitator. But a co-facilitator is a good way 
to learn and it's a good and it's also a good way to create to provide safety for the facilitator particularly if you're doing a really charged circle uh, you know it's easy to get it's a really hot topic it's easy to get triggered you know and maybe you lose your sense of presence or sense of grounding and to have another set of ears there to listen and jump in to help to assist um, is you know that's a good thing to have um, after you've been in a bunch of circles and you've facilitated uh, co-facilitated several circles then you can kind of switch and be the facilitator and have maybe a someone with a lot of experience be co-facilitator who's just there to you know observe you and back you up in case you need some support and uh, and I'd say uh, you know and then when the then when the you know more experienced facil facilitator feels like you're ready or you feel like you're ready you know then you can start organizing circles on your own and holding your own circles um, the other thing that Edwin and I would like to provide is a um, facilitator like support group so it would be like this we would get together and meet and people who's ever facilitating circles they could come and share so it's a it's a like a a meeting where people share practices they share challenges they share insights and people get support either emotional support or or um, uh, support with practice with skills and there is <clears throat> there is uh, Ingrid and I are working on a well she, she is the main driver to create a sort of a training an experiential training so we'll have an empathy circle but we'll be looking the whole meeting will be a bit about one aspect of it so one aspect is in a circle you're a speaker and we'll just explore the speaking role what, are, what is our experience being a speaker and then another meeting will be what is the experience of being a listener in an empathy circle? And then another meeting will be just on uh, what is it like to reflect back? What is your what you're hearing and what is the experience? So we'll be sort of taking the empathy circle and going into different components of it and kind of talking, uh, exploring it and, and discussing uh, that as well. And, and there's another role. So we've got the role of a participant, role of co-facilitator, role of facilitator. And another role is a circle producer. It's something I've been finding out. To organize a circle takes a lot of, just like a producer, you got to bring people together, you got to reach out, you got to do follow-up, and there's a lot of details. So you don't even need to take part in an empathy circle. You can be, I think we're going to develop that role just, you know, contacting people getting them together following up and it's quite a, just the challenge finding some couple of people on the left couple on the right so there's a lot of just organizational parts so the facilitator can do that but it is sort of a role uh, of its own yeah we've been interested to see that while lots of people have joined the facebook group i think there are like a hundred now we've announced you know probably four or five circles over the last uh, month or so and you know not not a lot of people have signed up and so we're not sure if that's the time slot or if it's um, when it actually comes to or the topic or if it comes to actually where it comes time for people to sign up they find themselves reluctant to do that for some reason they're nervous they've never done it before they don't know who the people are going to be you know what there's you know whether it has to do with some sense of safety or not so we're in, we're in the process of figuring that out we don't know for sure but we're in the process of figuring it out and we and i think it is our experience that when individuals this is kind of relate relates to the producer role that edwin was describing when someone reaches out individually and invites someone to be in a circle as opposed to just posting it online and saying you can sign up you know people are much more likely to say oh yeah yes i would like to do that um but that takes effort you know that takes extra effort to, to reach out to people individually and make contact and, and uh, convince them to, to participate. So we've talked a lot. I, I would be interested in now in hearing some feedback about what you've heard so far from anybody. I can speak up. Um, I think that I know for me, I've been lurking for a while, um, just sort of not sure where, whether I was, you know, I had the time, uh, or the inclination, you know, as much as I want to, 
um, I haven't I haven't found the time, and I've kind of you know got on this call now because I feel like I've got space in my life for it. So that might be one reason why some people aren't. And I, there have been some events where I was concerned for my safety. Um, you know, a lot of the groups that we're trying to sort of connect to or reach out to often use violent methods to get their points across. Uh, and even and the people that oppose them, of course, also can do that. So I had some concerns about that, you know, being a father and having kids and stuff that I didn't want to, you know, go with them or anything to that kind of event. So that's, that just gives you a little feedback about some of my reticence. Thank you. Rick? Uh, you're muted. Okay. Yeah, I hope this fits into what was asked, but I guess what's on my mind, I, the first time I, I did an empathy circle, it was, it was listening day. It was national listening day. That's when I met Edwin and, and started doing some of these circles. And I feel pretty capable of, of, of sharing them, but I'm aware of the challenge of getting people together. Um, and I'm also aware that we're a group of men right now. And I was just, what came to my mind was one of the women who was on that call, she does something called sidewalk talk. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if there's an opportunity to synergize there, perhaps. I just wanted to bring that into the field as a possible suggestion. Thank you. We, we do know the people at Sidewalk Talk, uh, and I am in the process of beginning to collaborate with the woman here in Petaluma that's doing Sidewalk Talk, uh, and that's a great um, uh, activity. Mm -hmm. And it's a little different than Empathy Circle in that the Sidewalk Talkers are just there to listen to whoever shows up, and we're really trying to create dialogue and teach people to listen to each other. So they're not, those two activities are not in conflict. Uh, in terms of like being exactly the same, they actually have, they each have their little niche. And, but there is, they, Sidewalk Talk actually has grown hugely. Yeah. And they do have, they have learned to scale. So that I'm sure there are lessons we can learn from them about scaling. Thank yes. you for bringing that up. And I'll just quickly say that uh, we have done two pop-up, Empathy Tent pop-ups with Sidewalk Talk in, in Oakland, as well as their manual, uh, they have a listening manual, and I have a, the empathy circle, they added the empathy circle practice to their way of training, of, of how to train, you know, train listeners. So it, we do have some connections, and we can definitely deepen them, too. And their online listening uh, training is excellent. I recommend it. Mm. Um, hi, this is Lewis. I, <clears throat> I hadn't heard of Sidewalk Talk, but I love hearing how many uh, different people are doing similar work. And instead of it feeling competitive, it just pleases me that we're all trying to do the same thing, even if we do it a little differently. Um, there's another group called AllSides.com, led by John Gable. There's an umbrella group called Bridge Alliance that has several different versions of these now all working together under that umbrella. And one that I became aware of recently with Joan Blades is livingroomconversations.org. And so I host many of those. <clears throat> and when I met Edwin and Lou, and Edwin joined one of my living room conversations recently, and mm -hmm. um, with him present after I had already done a um, empathy circle with Lou and Edwin, I chose, I hadn't even shared this with you quite, Edwin, but I, this was a week or so ago. I chose to take the living room conversation method of no crosstalk. We just each take turns commenting and answering certain questions. And the impact of it is, of course, very positive. We learn a lot about each other's perspectives. And, not but, I loved when I... When I t I'm a facilitator and a professional trainer and diversity trainer for 30, 40 years, so I actually love the process of when people open and get a little more authentic and energetic you know, with their feelings. And so with Living Room Conversations, when Edwin was in it, I allowed a man and a woman to go a little bit into it and, and cross-talk a little because I loved the energy. <clears throat> the response to them doing so was that they liked it so much they wanted to do a empathy circle with the next day, which Edwin posted and I was part of. And what I love about it is once we feel so heard, 
so well heard, even if other people have opposite opinions, it made every one of us end up next time we speak, go, wow, I feel so safe. Now I want to share this or this or this. And, and we all benefited from it. And so now the end of this part of my comments is that the woman, Edwin, I don't think I've even shared this with you, it just happened yesterday. The woman who had wanted to do that contacted me and said, Lewis, will you co-host with me two hours, the first hour of which is living room conversations and no crosstalk, and the second hour of which is, is, is mirroring each other uh, the way we learned in Empathy Circle? And I said, absolutely. So there's no right or wrong. We all need the impact that it's all having, and I love being part of it, and I would love to host uh, Empathy Circles too, very much. That's all. Thank you. I was going to also add maybe, um, you know, the sort of the, the, the producer stuff of like reaching out and following up and trying to make sure to get four people together. I imagine as if we do end up scaling up more, hopefully that would a little bit fall to the wayside as you know, you just have so many people that there's always going to be four people to click in as soon as something pops up. And with that in mind, Evan, I should have, I, I want to say that what Living Room Conversations does, they all do it and they all do it differently, but what they do is on their own website and Facebook, they list all the events that are ones that an individual could choose if they want. They could choose to host it, or it's going. they've got events happening on certain dates, and you could just choose to be in that. And again, no right or wrong, we're all different. I happen to not want to take the time to go create one and to get the people to come, but I'm absolutely free since I'm self-employed and work for myself and half retired that I will always accept an invitation as long as I'm free to be the host of one, even if it's only, you know, three hours from now, because as long as I have that two or three hour window, I love it. And, and whatever the topic, I'll do it. Um, so I'd rather just be listed as a host that people can choose or jump in at the last minute if I'm asked. So we're all different that way. Lewis, do you know who, who does that organizing for them? Um, I can't remember which individual, but uh, I know how to ask. Mary Gaylord is one of them on the emails that at least Edwin, you've seen with me. Mary's one. Uh, uh, Gail is one, but they keep changing it because they only have two or three people that get paid a little bit and they're 501c3 from the donations. All the rest of us are pure volunteers just doing this for heart. So I actually don't know who does it, but their website is growing every week with several of them being involved in doing it. Okay, thank you. Art, did you wanna say something? Yeah, you're muted, Art, you're muted. Sorry, thank there you. you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add one thing on a logistical producer kind of uh, sense that um, I noticed that on a few of these things, you know, with Facebook, it's it's often like a deluge of different events that you have, and I'm sure I'm not the only one that feels that, and it can get a little overwhelming. And I I know that when I I work with Zoom a lot with my uh, people that I work with too, and um, I find it very helpful when you and I'm not sure how to set it up. I'm, pretty new and not very technically uh, savvy, but I know that sometimes I'm, I'm able to send an uh, uh, invitation out where somebody can kind of click it and it imports into a calendar. And uh, I know that for me, when I, you know, once it's in the calendar, that's, you know, that's like gold. So, so it's like, it's something where I can't like avoid, you know? Um, you know, I, I did find it really helpful, Edwin, that you tagged me, you know, yesterday and then again today, that was, you know, awesome. Um, but I was looking for some way last night to add it to my calendar you know, so I wouldn't kind of forget. But uh, anyway, I, of course, I was able to add it manually. But uh, I just thought maybe that would be something to look into that, you know, make it very easy for people to just sort of, okay, book it. And now I'm in, you know, so that you don't mm -hmm. double book kind of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. Create an event on Google Calendar, and then it sends out a notice. And you just click on it, and it adds it automatically to your calendar. Yeah, making a note of that. Well, our living room conversations is just now starting to do it with Eventbrite. It's brand new. They just started it this week. Um, That's what Sidewalk Talk uses also. Right.
Any other feedback from people about anything that we've said so far in terms of the process or um, roles or anything? So I was going to mention one other capability for Zoom, which is breakout rooms. And so one way to do something like this would be to, to sort of market or advertise a singular event with a Zoom link and have facilitators teed up to participate and then break out whoever shows up as a participant with a facilitator for each group. And, and that way you could, you could scale that event provided you had enough facilitators you were confident in to, to turn loose. And so they didn't each have to go kind of round up their own group, but you could do a big marketing push on one click here everybody shows up and then you kind of break them out into groups. That's exactly what Living Room Conversations does. And by being one of the facilitators, you show up, as you said, and if they have 12 people, they break it into three groups of four or something like that. They, they also like four or five or six, not more than that, because we want more interactivity, of course. That works really well. Yeah, Bill, you're muted. Uh, I just wanted to circle back to, you know, why all men? <laughs> and I was just thinking that, um, it, you know, it, another uh, possibility is that we feel the deficit. In other words, we see them and we're feeling the deficit. So we're drawn to this to sort of, you know, to basically complete a good education. Uh, <laughs> that was just my point. That's all. Could be. I love that comment. I want to re reinforce it by simply saying, like you heard me say, I had to learn to do diversity training because I had to heal from my own ethnocentrism. Mm -hmm. So without any shame or blame, I love being around men who recognize the benefit of doing our own work and learning how to open more. Mm -hmm. And it's, it sort of matches what you're saying. Women, Most women do it pretty well already, and I at least needed to learn how to do it, and I love it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Um, how many of you have already participated in an empathy circle? Okay, most people. And of the ones that have participated, how many of you participated in, let's say, more than four or five empathy circles? Okay. All right. So the... Um, so I'm not really sure where to go from here. I mean, our, so our first recommendation is, you know, participating in the process is really, is really important uh, learning. Um, and, that, and that doing, a, I'd say, at least half a dozen circles is probably a good, um, good introduction. Uh, both so you're experiencing it and you kind of see what the facilitator does and not, and obviously different facilitators are a little different. Not everybody's not exactly the same. Um, so I encourage you <laughs> to, um, to do that. Um, did you want to say something, Rick? Yeah. Yeah. I just, I just want to report quickly that when Todd said how that could be done with a group and then we split, I felt like an ease in my body, mm. you know, it felt like it took some kind of weight off the, the, the journey, you know, so I just want to give that feedback. And is that, is that weight about organizing or you feel some lift about there because of the, the possibility for a reduction in the, in the effort in organizing? Yeah. On the one hand, I like the organizing cause I could pull in people that I know perhaps and, and, and become closer to them. But I, that could, that takes a lot of energy. I know that from doing it. And yeah. if we did it as a huddle, you know what I mean? It might, it might happen easier, it might flower easier. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I am really interested in, in trying to find out what the roadblocks are, whether they are topic, time frame, length, uh, safety, or I think those are the ones I can think of. Um, uh, 
yeah, and I'm not sure it's probably some combination of those things, but the when I immediately think about like inviting everyone and trying to create a big event and have multiple people split up, I think I guess it's the part of me that thinks it's probably time that you know you need to get because there's a couple different dimensions. If you announce a topic and you say we're going to be talking about you know identity politics or something like that, so you need people who are interested in that who are also available at the same time frame who are also in different parts of the political spectrum. So there's kind of three dimensions that that need to align. And the more dimensions you have, of course, the more difficult it is to align. So I wonder whether we'll ever have the problem of um, having too, so many people, <laughs> you know, inviting lots of people and like getting a big group of people that we have to split up. That would be great if we did. But I, that's not a problem we're currently having. <laughs> My experience is that the biggest problem is the organization to make it happen, which is, uh, and, and we've all, or some of us have done it, have done it with real face-to-face -face humans in our locale, and that's not easy. You, you think that'll be the easiest, because I can contact friends, but how many of us have friends with enough range to make it that interesting? And whereas, just to exaggerate, by going online with people who signed up online, and you've never met them, and they come from all over the country, to me is wonderful. And because every one of us is a new experience to one another, and I just love that. Uh, but it's also just happens as long as they can do it on the website or Facebook or wherever you sign up for that date on that topic. It just happens. And if you can be zoomed into more than one group, if there's more than six, that happens. And I think it's way better to to use the, the Zoom or whichever method of video all over the country than to try to organize your own locally. That's my own experience, even though they're all wonderful. I've done them all. Yeah, and I, and I would say you know, my assumption has been because the pool is so big. So right, if you're saying people can come from anywhere in Zoom, because the pool is so big and the friction for participation is so low, you don't have to drive anywhere, you don't, have, you, you don't need it, this big block of time Right. or the, the amount of time is reduced to whatever the exact participation is, yeah. that, that that would make it easier for people to do it. And I've been surprised, you know, that the circles haven't come together more easily. Well, we are scaling up. So I mean, we yeah. just kind of got started in the last month, really online. So I think this is a pretty good turnout right here for people interested in facilitating. And uh, so I think as we scale up, people get familiar with it. We develop more tools, so we're really learning by doing. It's not like we're doing a big planning up front. We're jumping into it, and we're, we're just iterating. We'll just keep iterating on the process and sort of uh, develop it by, by doing. So I think it'll, I think it'll scale up. We did, there is a poll that was asked, like, why are not more people taking part? Top topic was that you just haven't, it hasn't worked with the time uh, yet, and there was others. Questions. So we'll be harvesting those uh, insights and try to develop processes to uh, address those. Right, and since you both who helped co-create this uh, want us to have more experience before <clears throat> you're 100% comfortable to, to just going off and facilitating on our own, I think it's great. Why don't we just pick this 10 people and pick a time when you want to have two circles with five of us in each, or four of us visitors with each of you, and let's just do it sometime soon and enjoy each other doing it. And then we'll be experts, all of us. <laughs> yeah, uh, Lou idea. is doing one tonight, actually. Uh, I don't know, did you find the second no, liberal? We were looking for a, a female uh, liberal to participate, uh, but it could be a, it could be a male. Um, uh, yeah, the circles on, um, the circles on how, how do you identify uh, politically? You know, well, like, wh if you call yourself a conservative, why do you call yourself that? If you call yourself a liberal, why do you call yourself that? Um, but I, like, I very much like Lewis's suggestion, you know, we can just, we could have circles with this people in this group. Um, uh, I think that's a great, great idea. One other thing I want thumbs up, so yeah, go ahead. Okay. I want to second, second that idea. I don't know if you're talking about now or another time, but I like that. And I, I'm just wondering if, if you gather people under the flag of empathy, 
in a circle and then just allow people to say what issues might be alive for them. You could yeah. then br break in. It, it might just, you know, I'm just posing another way of approaching it that, that feels alive. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to suggest that you do kind of an open space thing. And yeah. I mean, in any group of people, I'm convinced we can find something to disagree about. Right. <laughs> And so going with which is the most alive, I think, is a really convenient way. It takes a little bit of sort of turning loose of the pl I'm a planner, right? So it makes it kind of wigs me out to think about doing that. But when I've tried things like that that are real open-ended, it's always been a beautiful experience. So do all that. You two try to pick two dates right now if you want. I'm just brainstorming. And if we can find two dates that each agree to, then that group can pick the topic they want. And we're on. We can. And, and I'll say, I mean, I set aside two hours for this from noon to two. Uh, and we're only an hour in. So I would also be fine with taking the second hour. And maybe Edwin and I could split the group. And, uh, and we could do an empty circle in the next hour for the next hour. That, that I, in, in addition to what you're saying. No, no. Or instead of. I love brainstorming. I'm totally okay. open to that as well. I mean, if this, looking at my calendar, if this time slot is good for people, I could do this uh, at the same time next week. Probably, hang on, let me look. Um, from my point, I, I get an hour out of work and I can take a break. I'm taking a little extra time today. Uh -huh. I can always get an hour in. But I like your idea, if you want to spend the next hour, doing two groups of four led by each one of you i'm i'm available mm -hmm. okay. if we all set aside two hours maybe we all are and i also say i'm trying to set up a circle every saturday at 10 a.m and i haven't set it up this week uh didn't just had a lot of other stuff but i could uh, host it at 10 a.m is anybody that specific time does anybody want to take part in that is this saturday i could do it I cannot. I'm occupied then Evan, with, my, with my son. Okay. Uh, um, is, how uh, long is that? Is that two hours? Two or go, two, hour? go two hours. You said 10 a.m.? 10 a.m. Pacific. Yeah, earlier might even be better for me. I don't know if I could do two hours at that time. but An hour uh, I'm good at 10 a.m. on Saturday Pacific. Okay, then well, that's going to be the regular time I set for this every every week. So I'll I'll post that into the group, and we can do the organizing into the Facebook page, uh, so we could do the organizing there. But yeah, I, I I'm up for splitting the group and doing two doing an hour of empathic. Okay, let me um, <laughs> let me put a a you uh, a link in the chat. Um for my group. Um, Norm normally that Saturday would be fine though. Saturday at 10 a.m. would be great for me. Okay. Um, but I, I don't think I can stick around for this. Because uh, okay. yeah. uh, during the weekdays, like during the week, during the day is not so great for me. Um, but once in a while, it's fine. But for now, are we, are we be, Evan, are you saying for this two hour period, you're still available for one hour or not? No, I should probably get back to work if it's if it's if we're just going to break out into a sort of an empathy circle because um, just I work from home during the day, so I want to I don't want to be too unavailable for that for uh, work today. Okay, so that's uh, yeah. So the two things that we're doing one is just take part in empathy circles over the coming you know, and then can move towards uh, becoming a facilitator. Second, I'll be the, we'll be setting up these other facilitator support groups, which will, so those are kind of the two options. Yeah, so we'll need, we need to announce a time for a facilitator support group. Um, and we will, yeah. You'll do that, do that online, so. Can, okay. What's that? So, uh, who would like to come with me into a circle? Maybe. Um, let's see. How do we do this? I don't know. Sign apartment. So I, I posted the URL to my Zoom room in the chat. So whoever decides to come with me. Oh, you can do. We can do breakout groups. Oh. So I can, can just. Do that, 
Yeah, okay. manually. Right, I'm going to manually create this breakout group to assign. I'm going to start oh. to head out, guys, but thank okay. you. Okay, great. Bye. Take care. Yeah, actually, I think I probably should head out, too. I don't have to play an hour. I can maybe do another 20 minutes, but I don't want to throw things off. So maybe I'll shoot for Saturday. Okay. okay. Great. I'll yeah. put, I didn't notice that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Thank you. I, for some reason, this wound up on my calendar as an hour and a half instead of two hours. So I've got till 3.30. I'm yeah, happy actually, to join a group and observe, but not participate. You know, what? maybe what we could do is, why don't we just do a little one little practice group here just on one topic and just so we can observe each other. And okay. I think it was listed for an hour and a half. So we think we should. Okay. So, okay. Um, so do you so, want to just introduce, so we just introduce how to do an empathy circle to give a little overview and then sure. just practice with the people here. Okay. So, so this is the way an empathy circle works. Um, we take timed turns for speaking and usually it's, three minutes, I wouldn't suggest less than three minutes. That's not, you know, if you're doing speaking and someone's reflecting, then less than three minutes doesn't give you much time to say anything. So three or five minutes. Usually we do an empathy circle with four participants and a facilitator. Uh, so someone offers to go first and usually the facilitator is the first reflector. So someone goes first and speaks for three minutes and while they are speaking they occasionally pause so that the person who's reflecting can reflect back what you're hearing. And if you're the reflector, that your only job is to reflect back what you're hearing, not to analyze it, not to agree with it or disagree with it or praise it or anything other than just this is what I'm understanding you're saying. And the goal is to is for the person who's speaking to feel like they are fully received and understood. And when the person reflects back to you, if you're the speaker, you know, if it's not right, you say, no, that's not quite right. It's more like this. Or you could say, you got this part, but this part was important. And I want you to, I really want you to hear that. At when the three minutes is up, a uh, timer goes off and you, the person have to, doesn't have to stop right that second, but the timer is the signal for them to finish up what they're saying and get a final reflection. And then the, then the listener the, or the reflector becomes the speaker and they select another person in the circle to be their reflector. And we kind of hold that, well, we want to give freedom for people to choose who's going to reflect them back. We do ask that um, you choose someone who has not reflected yet in the, in the round of going around. And that way everybody gets a chance to speak because this, reflector becomes the speaker. So that way everyone, you know, eventually gets a chance to speak and you don't get things going back and forth between two people. But it is your choice as a speaker. Ultimately, it's your yeah. choice who you want to have hear you. Yes. Um, and that's it. The, the turns happen and the, the dialogue goes around the circle. Sometimes there's a topic for the circle, like, um, uh, what is your political affiliation? Or it might be, how do we reduce the, the uh, conflict in politics? Or it might be just what's alive in you right now. Uh, or it might be what's alive in you around politics. <laughs> so it could be very specific or it could be very broad. Uh, yeah, that, lead, that leads me to ask, whereas in living room conversations, they have a list of every, every issue you can imagine, you know, abortion and, and polygamy or politics or whatever. Is yeah. yours all political or do you also want it to be full range? Well, in the empathy tent, right. we are doing this work in the, in the arena of politics. Fine. In the online circles, the right-left dialogue circles we've been trying, I think, we're doing them in the political arena. But you could even do what's up for you right now in the area of politics, what, what's alive in you right now about it. That's, but the empathy circle process, that process, that tool can be used in any Oh, of course. Any kind of circumstance, any kind of conflict, or even non-conflict, just wanting to connect and understand. Oh, right. So, no, I'm, I'm going to blend some of it in living room conversations with or without their permission. And I'm <laughs> so going to... There the topic could be anything. 
That's right. So I'll Did you have that. something, Todd? Just I think you're about to say something before. Do you want to be sure it was heard? I'm sorry. Yeah, I had two questions. Um, one of them, based on what you were just saying with the facilitator as the first reflector, does that mean yeah. that then they're the second speaker in That's general? Correct. That's correct. Okay, and is that f for modeling? Well, the, the being the first reflector really is for modeling. And and actually, so what it models being the second speaker is that the, the facilitator participates just like anyone else. Okay. And uh, yeah. So okay, we're gonna jump I'm... into it. So just do it and it'll, yep. so should we get started? And maybe just whatever's alive for everyone. What, where do you have energy around right now? With, or do you have- Yes, and I'll, your... I'll say, I'll say, um, What's alive in you around politics? Uh, and this is also a principle of the circle. You don't have to speak to the question if you don't want to. <laughs> you, you have freedom in what you choose to speak about. Um, but let's, let's do that as the, as the topic is, what's alive in you around politics? Who would like to be the first speaker? And I'll be the first reflector. Okay. Okay. Art went first, so go Art. So yes, Art, I'd be happy to listen to you. Go ahead. Great, thank you very Art, much. I'll keep giving... time, three minutes. Thank you, Okay, Edwin. cool, cool, thank you, Edwin. Uh, and thank you, Lou, for giving me the space. Um, I'm glad to go first because there's a very highly charged uh, uh, thing in my mind politically. And it's, uh, you know, it's not necessarily current politics, but it is, and it, and it in involves uh, George H.W. Bush. And I'm really very disturbed at how we seem to have this revisionist history and we're we're praising this you know who i consider to be a war criminal and a, and a you know a human rights violator you know based on what he did in you know the middle east and what he did with uh, aids patients in, in the u.s and i'm just really struggling with this idea and i'm trying you know not to be reactive about it i'm trying not to get into arguments about it but it, it's something that's really troubling to me so so let me reflect back what i'm hearing so far so you're excited to speak and be heard for something that's really alive in you strongly, which is the, what's going on now with the, all the stuff that's being said about George H.W. Bush, remembering him as a president now that he's gone. You're really struggling with what you call revisionist history, which is, you know, you really see him as a war criminal and are aware of many things he did that hurt a lot of people. And it's hard for you to listen to him being honored and all the positive things being said about him. And you're wondering, what about all these other things? That's exactly right. Thank you. And I think, I think one of the reasons I'm excited here is that this is a safe place to bring it up. And, and I think that's one of my struggles is that there's, there's very few safe places to bring this up, especially Facebook. You know, um, any conversations I seem to have, it's like, you know, you get these very extreme views on it and, it's, and it could be pretty dangerous in a way emotionally. So you're also feeling grateful because of the safety here for saying it because these feelings are very strong in you and you really want to express them and you're not really sure where you can do that. You're really worried about like starting a big argument or getting you know bashed on Facebook or other venues because it's you don't really know where it's safe and so it feels good to have a safe, safe place to do that. That's exactly right. I feel heard. Thank you, Lou. Thanks. Okay. Um, is there more? I guess you're not at your time limit more. Is there any more that you want to be heard for? Uh, um, and you don't have to. I'm just asking. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't, I don't know how to articulate anymore, but that was really okay. the, the gist of it. I appreciate you, you listening. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I will ask um, Todd, will you listen to me? Yes, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Okay, so what's alive for me in the political realm? So <laughs> I also have concerns about, so I have worries about expressing what's really true for me when I'm in a group of progressive people and I'm hearing something said that I think is making a lot of assumptions or is, you know, kind of like left-wing group think. And even though I am progressive, you know, that it, what it sounds to me is like 
you know, the standard line. And it, it doesn't really have any nuance and it's not, it does not very individual, like it's not very uh, moderated to the circumstance that we're talking about. And I want to say something about that and I'm really afraid to because I'm afraid people are going to attack me. Yeah, so what I'm hearing you say is that, in, uh, particularly in, in groups of progressive or left-leaning friends, colleagues, acquaintances, that you're experiencing a level of fear in saying what's alive for you, what's the honest truth that you see in the situation. And um, it arises in so many cases in instances where what you're hearing is what you always hear from a left-leaning perspective. And so that there's not this really um, freedom to exchange ideas, but you're just sort of, uh, uh, the, the group conversation is caught up in a group think of the things that are always said in those conversations from that perspective. Is that yes. right? Yes, thank you. I mean, I, I think of this as being, f uh, I think of myself as being fair-minded, which is that when someone makes an argument, I am thinking, does this make sense to me? Is there evidence for what they're saying? Or what this thing that you're saying, what evidence is it based on? And not just, well, everybody knows, you know, I mean, this is obvious. There are lots of studies and everybody knows. And particularly like when I think about trying to work on local issues. So yes, there are things like racism exists. And then it's like, well, so if we're going to talk about racism in my town, like, are we going to, is, is there something that needs to be done? We should be asking what's going on in our town, not just like, well, there is racism. So of course, you know, there's a huge problem with that in our town without actually looking at the, any data or any, or asking any questions. About it. And and so, yeah, so, yeah, I just feel strongly about wanting to take a fair amount of approach to the social things that I work on and really being, wanting to examine them and see what's really there as opposed to just assuming things. So your view of where you're coming from is that uh, it's a stance that's fair-minded, that you want to um, evaluate, to listen carefully to the arguments that are being posed, and to be able to make a fair evaluation of what's being said. That's, uh, that's I've been giving a time cue. Yes, yeah, so thank, thank you very much. I feel heard. What was the meaning of the time queue? It was a number three. We had three minutes. So we're at three minutes. So I just announced okay. he had three minutes. Okay. The time was up. Just you kind of wrap okay. up after you see that. Yep. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. So you get to pick a, a reflector now. <clears throat> oh, well, Rick, would you be able to uh, be willing to reflect for me? Yes, you're muted, Rick. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, no, oh, thanks. So let me think for just a minute or a moment because <laughs> there's only three minutes. <clears throat> What's alive for me right now? I share some of the concerns, um, I guess, that, that Art raised in that in these there's lots of news coverage and that's part of what stirs up I think all of us at some level um, in the political realm of what's what's sort of front of mind in the media and the the funeral of George H.W. Bush was on my goodness the man has a lot of funerals <laughs> there was one yesterday and another one today um, and yeah you've got this whole thing of you don't want to speak ill of the dead and you want to acknowledge the good that people did and you've got this um, with our our current president is radically different I think from a lot of the other presidents in my lifetime and so you know some of what I so objected to doesn't seem as bad <laughs> so sorry um, with all the judgment that's buried in all of that. And so I, I share that kind of tension of you want to acknowledge what was good and it seems as though in this moment when all that acknowledgement is going on that we're overlooking some things that really were not good and, and in fact did great damage in various parts of the world. 
I'll pause for a moment and give you a chance to see what you make of that. Sure, sure. Um, I hear you acknowledging that we're, we're affected by the media's uh, coverage of things. And right now, the, the coverage of, of Bush, there's a discomfort that you're, you, it sounds like you're echoing what, what Art said, that there's a discomfort in not being able to, how do you express, um, you know, how, how do you honor the, the, the dead, the dying, the, the passing on of a life, but also acknowledge the things that you don't agree with that, that are bad? Did I yeah. did I get it or did I yeah embellish? yeah no thank you that was that was the heart of it okay and I think maybe what I'm coming to as I'm talking is a realization that it's also the the loss and the grief of the people who hold him dear that's at stake too that if I were to wade in with my um, objection that there's something about not being able to honor the grief and the loss that others are experiencing that may not bring the same perspective as I do to that. So I, I suppose maybe what I'm talking myself into um, is that by acknowledging for myself in this moment, hey, that doesn't negate all these negative things, doesn't make them not real, but to try to talk to somebody in mourning about it may be not the best time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so what I hear you coming to, it sounds like, is that um, you want to honor the grieving um, people who are grieving, who, who, who cared or who are connected to, to his legacy and not kind of step on them, but also you're coming to, it sounds like a space where you can also honor your own feelings, but not not in a public way that would interrupt them. I think. I think that's yeah. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I guess the last thing I'll say is that I'm grateful for a, a circle that would would host a space for the stream of consciousness I've just uttered um, that I was figuring out as I said it, um, because there's actually I don't have that experience very often. So thank you. So you want to just reflect back that piece and then pick a listener? Uh, sure. Um, so, okay, let me get my screen. What I heard is just gratitude for the space that would allow um, Todd to um, stream of consciously express um, what, was, what was happening and come to terms with it and have it be received. Yes, thank you. Um, Art, will you will you be my listener? Absolutely, Rick. Okay. Um, so, so I'm going to step in as facilitator. Yes. Because Rick spoke already. I'm going to ask that you pick someone else so they have a chance to speak after you. Oh, that's right. Art spoke already. Yep. Okay. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Doing that, um, Martin. Would you would you be my listener? Uh, you're muted, Martin. Yeah, I'm there. Okay. Um, so, what's alive for me around politics? Um, um, I'm just trying to get my screen right so that I can see you and be talking to you. That's just that. Okay. Um, what's alive for me around politics? Well, right now in my body, I want to acknowledge that there's like discomfort in my back and my whole right side, right? And um, for me, I, I think um, in my storytelling, I try to paint a picture of a world where, where all needs could be um, articulated and met. And I struggle with the world as it is. So I'm talking about financial things, which isn't direct to, it's just always there. The finan finances, the struggle with finances is just always there. So I, I'll pause there for a second. So um, 
I hear you say that you were looking for something that was alive for you in politics right now, and that led you into expressing a bodily expression of that in terms of how it actually affects your body. And then that led you into, uh, 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 it looked like a sort of an analysis of your financial situation and other people's financial situations and, um, uh, and how that, all those things are interlinked. Your, your, the finances, the bodily feeling, the politics, somehow or other, they're all interlinked. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate hearing that. And I guess for me, that's the, the underlying thing that might not always be spoken of is the stress that's created um, from financial, trying to figure it all out, trying to, trying to juggle everything like most people are. And this creates um, greater, you know, conflicts. And, and for me, I would love to talk about what, what a world would be like with, with maybe guaranteed income for people in connection to some, you know, I would like to have that conversation and that conversation seems to be um, not, uh, th there's, it, it doesn't get the, 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 the platform that I would like it to see, to see it get, you know, some kind of transformative thing that takes the stress off of, off of people so that they can really shine and flourish and kind of even have more time for these things. You know what I mean? Right. So the, um, the stress that is created by uh, financial situations is a, is, is a distraction. So you'd like to see a situation, something like uh, guaranteed annual incomes, um, where um, that particular piece of the stress puzzle was removed from you and other people uh, so that people could then bloom into who they really are and, and express themselves in these kinds of situations and others and, and, and not have to worry about uh, just food on the table. Yes. Thank you. That feels good. Appreciate that. Hear it being heard. Okay. Okay. You're welcome. Yeah. Okay. Let me just go back to the other view here. Who have we got left then? Um, uh, let me see. So I guess it would be Lewis. You haven't. Has somebody spoken to you yet? Lewis and Bill, if I've got it right, we are the two okay, left. Yes. So okay, it doesn't well, matter which of us you choose, because we'll, the other will be next. <laughs> okay, Lewis, may I choose you? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, yes, I, uh, I mean, we live in such challenging times with all, the, all these uh, <laughs> massive changes sweeping down on us from so many different directions that um, sometimes it seems hard to get a grip on anything. Um, tomorrow I'm going with my 12 year old grandson. We're going to the, the student strike protest, uh, uh <laughs> the, where all the students in the world are theoretically going to strike tomorrow and, and tell their leaders to get off the pot. So I'm very much looking forward to going down to the parliament buildings with him and just uh, being his support person. Wow. Can, can I ref can I reflect you there so I don't get lost? Uh, the two points I hear are that just in the face of so much change, it's tough to keep up with it all and stay centered and balanced. And then you you gave us an example of how tomorrow you're taking your twelve year old uh, grandson or stepson grandson right um, to a student protest event that here sounds like it's national. I'm not aware of it. I'd like to learn more, but to a student protest event. And that's just one example of the challenge of change you're facing. Yes, yes, absolutely. And uh, I mean, it does come from so many different directions. I mean, uh, I'm very much involved in the whole um, climate change uh, situation. You might have heard we had a big announcement here in British Columbia of a whole new uh, environmental uh, uh, path that we're going to go down here. And, uh, and I imagine that would be reflected also in a place like California and Colorado, but uh, it, in an awful lot of places, it doesn't seem to be reflected yet um, that, the, you know, that we are going to have to make some pretty massive changes in just about every part of our lives. Right. So I hear that at least in British Columbia, and you hope it's true in California, or assume it might be, that we are 
recognizing that climate change is having a significantly negative impact on several aspects of our lives and that therefore we may have to face some dramatic changes and choose some dramatic changes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, and, and I think from a, a, at a very personal level, um, you, you know, I think that the, you know, the Kubler-Ross and the, and the processing, the, the grief uh, that, that one can feel when one is wrapped up in these kind of issues all day is um, something I'm still, still very much struggling with um, in my own life. Just while we're, well, the Bush funeral is an example of dealing with grief, that even in your own life, we, you have issues, in, including grief, I hear, but issues that are uh, a challenge to have to deal with. There are just so many of them. There are, although I didn't mention Bush. <laughs> That's true. When you said grief today, I presumed you were, you were reflecting that, but you're right, you did not say that. Thank you. No, different country. <laughs> very much so. <laughs> but I, I do feel heard. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Great. Although it was wonderful, I want to say, to hear from your prior administrator in, in the funeral. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, he made a good, uh, a good eulogy. What a nice. Although, one that okay, can we stay on the process? Eulogy. That's right. Sorry. I did not hear you say you saw him speak. But uh, <laughs> thank you. You're right. We went off on a bit of a ramble there. Sorry. Thank about. you. All right. So I get a chance to have Bill speak. Yes. I yeah. mean, hear me. Yes. Okay. So I know we have little time. So I want to first thank not only the process, because I love it too, but specifically Art and Todd uh, for owning their own uh, feelings of discomfort about what's going on during the Bush thing, and especially Arts. Todd, yours was more uh, comfortable to feel. Arts was so direct that I thank you for that, Art, because as you heard me say in the beginning, I'm one who really does uh, do my best to, to, with every president and every person, take what I can use, leave the rest, see the parts that I consider to be positive and see the parts that I consider to be negative or imperfect. And that's, that's true for every president, given my age, from Kennedy on that I've watched, every single one of them. And therefore, for me, uh, Bush is, oh, sorry, go. Yeah, let me, let me reflect that. Thank you. Events. Okay, so uh, you want to express uh, your gratitude to Art and Todd for their uh, reaction to the Bush funeral extravaganza, and uh, that you felt that Todd uh, was a little bit more uh, kind of comfortable and a little bit, uh, and then Arts was uh, more stark, but you also appreciated both of those because um, they helped you uh, highlight, you know, what's going on for yourself. And for your own personal process, what you do is you try to look at presidents or anybody else and look at the good, look at the bad, take the good and let the bad go. Well, or they, just let the bad, I don't have to let it go. I did say, take what you can use and leave the rest. That's in situations where I do have that choice. But in this case, I actually prefer being able with consciousness to notice, hmm, I like this issue or this action that this president believes in and I don't like this one, the same president. Right. Because there are things about each of them I like and things about each of them I haven't liked, okay? Including Bush. And so the reason I'm more thankful or for bringing it up is that I immediately felt triggered. That doesn't mean you're the cause of it. I'm triggered because it's my work. Since I'm only remembering the things I liked mostly about him and his ethics and how there are very few progressive Republicans left, you know, who did it, who do anything good. And, and I'm aware of some of the things he did that I support. And yet when you, and therefore, when you say what you said, it, it not only triggers me to feel vulnerable, it makes me want to open to hear mm -hmm. and be reminded of the mm -hmm. things that that you and others don't feel he did well, and we will end up, I hope, having things we each agree he did well, we each agree he did not do well, and some things 
where I think he did it great and you think he did that one thing was terrible or vice versa. And I just like, the, I love learning for myself the clarity about which ones we both think somebody did well, which ones we think they didn't, and which ones we disagree, because then I learn both sides. I don't feel the conflict. I learn from it. Okay. Thank you. I wish we had time to do that now, but that's the gift I feel from this energy. Okay. So you, um, you appreciate the, uh, the difference, the divergence of opinions, and, and everything that goes through in evaluating the presidents, both good and bad, and that you also appreciate that the people and the participants who talk about that have their own perspectives, and you certainly enjoy and uh, being opposed to that and participating in that sort of respectful but uh, spirited dialogue. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. I feel heard. So, no. Yeah, so thank you, everyone. So we are at 1.30, and yeah, Bill. Let's I get Bill. Art hasn't had a chance to reflect. And you haven't had a chance to speak, so why don't we close the circle with Bill speaking and Art reflecting? Okay. Yeah. I uh, definitely have a few more minutes. Yeah. Thanks. Have, okay. I'll, I'll Thank you. Um, I really appreciate this. I, uh, uh, I certainly I feel that I learned from everybody. It's great to hear. Uh, I can also um, I didn't identify my political leanings, but generally they'd be left. Um, but as a special education teacher. Uh, the, the, you know, conservatives certainly, because when I was, this, I was talking about respect for authority <laughs> uh, and all of these things, uh, before we could then flower, uh, we had to have safety. Um, and so that I look at uh, uh, progressivism or innovation and conservatism in a non-political view, in the sense you need both for pro progress uh, if you don't change anything, you're going to be stuck on the basically, you know, pounding rocks like uh, our ancestors. And if you don't build on something, you're constantly reinventing the wheel. And that's where conservative can have. So it's a question of what you value in both of those things as to how you progress. And, and I feel that that dialogue is missing. So I'll stop there for a second. Thank you. Yes, I, uh, I heard you uh, express gratitude. Um, for this open forum, and and uh, and I hear you expressing that um, the conservatism, especially as it you know relates to your work, the conservatism versus liberalism uh, has a broader spectrum than just political. And uh, and I I hear that you're um, you're talking about um, uh, shoot. I'm sorry, I just got distracted. Um, that's all right. Yeah, well, that, that's good for so far. Yeah, okay. yeah, we we can. And um, I also wanted to come out as as because I've been uh, I don't feel guilty about it, but I've been grousing about the Bush funeral myself, um, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, to me, it's there's this sort of uh, navel gazing of the media. I mean, I find that I am really happy about some of the media and stuff, and depending upon my opinions, but there's this navel gazing that they do where they're so uh, wonderful with each other and everything is so wonderful. And I feel that they pass the rest of reality and America by. Yeah, I, I hear you saying that, um, that you share my opinions with uh, about the Bush situation, but without the guilt. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I hear you, uh, and I hear you saying about the uh, the navel gazing of the media, um, you know, how, how they focus on just the sort of uh, rosy things and everybody sort of like keeps going back and forth about how, you know, the, the beauty of what they're, you know, expressing, but leaving out this giant, you know, sort of uh, negative thing that happens as well. Right. And in summation, I'll just say that I was really appreciative of, of, of uh, participating with you all and meeting you all. And it just re, uh, it reinforces uh, my feelings about the value of uh, empathy circles. Thank you. Great. I hear, I hear more gratitude from you about this process and about this group in particular and how it's, it's you know, sort of feeding your interests and, and opening you up to doing more. Great. Thank you. I feel hurt. Thank you. Okay. So I want to thank everybody. I also want to acknowledge that Edwin didn't get a chance to speak, but that's okay. We participate in lots of empathy circles. The purpose was for people that hadn't had a lot of practice to do it. 
since this is a, was a facilitator's call and we were doing this to practice, I'm curious if anyone has any questions about the process that we just did. No, but I thought we all did get to speak and be heard, and I thought it was so brief that it was a perfect trial, and I really thank you for doing it. Okay. Art, you had a question? Yeah, I, you know, I, I got lost when I really apologize for that, that, you know, it's, it's just, I think sometimes with the amount of time, you know, it's like I, I sort of like get behind. Is there, is there a way to, to format it to a certain, you know, sort of timed pause or have you ever yeah, dealt so, with that before? Yeah, so, the, so first off, sometimes it happens that, that I will get distracted or something will happen, I will lose the thread. It isn't that I'm not listening but all of a sudden I've lost the thread of what the person said. And I just asked them to say it again, <laughs> which if we, ha if we weren't pressed for time, I would have encouraged you to do. Okay. So that's not, that happens. The other thing is um, you, something you saw Bill do, uh, uh, and, I would, and I would have done this as a facilitator if the participants are not doing it, which is that if the person is saying more than you can take in, if you're the listener, and they are saying more than you could take in, you do what's called compassionate interruption. You say, excuse me, can you hold on for a second? I wanna make sure that I'm getting what you're saying so far. Let me reflect it back to you. People who participate in Empathy Circle a lot understand the rhythm like that and they don't, they pause. And that was certainly happening in this circle. But also people's capacity to take in, the amount that they can take in is different depending on how charged the topic is, you know, and. So it varies. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the roles of the facilitator is if you think, let's say the speaker is really charged and they're just going on, you know, or it's a new circle and people, it's the first couple of rounds and people are not used to stopping. As a facilitator, I would stop them and say, okay, hold on just a second there. Let the, let the listener reflect back what they're hearing. Okay. May I ask one follow-up question? I, I hear you saying that it's, uh, you know, that I hear you saying kind of two things, one from the perspective of the individual based on, you know, what my own capacity might be, and the other based on sort of the whole process, you know, uh, speaking more to how a person might be speaking. So, so addressing the first point, is there, in your suggestion, do you have a suggestion on, on a, uh, a sort of proper way to do that? Because I felt a couple of times during uh, that first space that I wanted to do that, but I felt like there wasn't a good time to like jump in and do it. Is there a sensitivity that you can help me with on that or it's just whatever? I just, uh, yeah, I, I just jump in. Right. Um, and I think, um, you know, as a facilitator, what I've definitely experienced is even though I, and I didn't say it actually in the introduction to this circle, I didn't say if, if you're the listener and the speaker is going on for too long, just stop them and say, you know, hang on a second. I usually say that in the introduction. But even if you say in the introduction, most people will not do it, you know, because A, they haven't seen it done. So it's not a norm that they've seen demonstrated. And B, th this is a new person and the person's talking and they, you know, it, it takes a lot of uh, uh, confidence to interrupt someone that, you're, that you've just met, you know, and you're supposed to be listening to them. So, so I usually wind up jumping in as a facilitator and saying, if I think like a full idea has been expressed, I will usually right. say, okay, hold, hold it there for a minute and let the listener reflect back. And Bill's right. done a lot of empathy circles, so he's familiar with just- That's right, that's why he was example. doing that. Yeah. Interesting, yeah. interesting. With Lewis. Yeah. Great, well, thank you. Is there more? Any comments for the experience? Okay. Something, something that, we didn't really get in this circle a little bit with between Lewis and Martin was the the speaker saying no no that that isn't no you're misunderstanding me this is what I was trying to say and it happened a little bit when Martin says no I didn't I didn't say George W Bush or and my sense of it Martin was when you when you referenced uh, Kubler Roth you were just talking about loss in general, not about death, right? Not about George Bush's death. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so there was a little misunderstanding, which is, you know, it's not a problem when there's a misunderstanding. You're, when, you're the, when you're the reflector, you're trying to reflect back and you might get it completely wrong. And it's fine if you misunderstand it. It's just, um, then, you, then it's really okay for the speaker to say, no, no, 
you're not getting me. And this is another thing that speakers are sometimes reluctant to do, is to say, no, that isn't it. And I, some, and I will do this as a facilitator sometimes. It, ha it has to be a pretty big miss for me to do something as a facilitator, because usually if it's mostly there, most speakers will say, yeah, you got most of it, or yeah, that was good enough, or yes, I felt heard, even if it was off a little bit. But if it was a really a complete miss, and I can see that the, the speaker is just, you know, not wanting to say, no, you didn't get it or something like that. And they're just saying, no, no, it's okay, go ahead. I might break in and say, well, I was hearing this, is this or I'm seeing the expression on your face and I'm kind of wondering whether you actually feel it heard, you know, and say something about it. And this is what we'll be exploring uh, in the Empathy Circle Facilitators uh, training and support group is what's the experience, you know, bringing up all these experiences, the kind of in more fine nuances and looking to deal with it. Yeah, Martin? Yes, yeah, certainly in, uh, in mediations, we're often trying to guess at motivations. And so you might sort of invent a little story saying, well, you know, and you'll throw it out on the table. And you'll often have people come and say, no, no, that's absolutely not what it's about. And that's absolutely okay. You know, oh, okay. Well, tell me some more. You know. And in this process, in this process, we don't want to do a lot of analysis. So the, the reflector really should not be doing a lot of analysis. It's really more just trying to hear fully what the person's saying and reflecting that back. If you try to do a lot more than that, people tend to experience it as analysis, like you're analyzing. Them. Right. And one of the things I want to add, and I experienced, is not there's not only a gift in feeling heard, I actually find it to be almost as great a gift to, to learn how to hear better. Mm -hmm. so, so to have that moment happen for me, instead of being defensive about it, or instead of analyzing it, which I'm also guilty sometimes of doing, in this case, I got, oh, of course, I totally projected what my own emotions were in these three days, which wasn't said at all. So that's, that's a great learning for me, and I thank you. <laughs> it means I have a lot more to learn. Okay. Well, um, let's see. Is there anything else that we want to say before we go? I, you know, I would like to say thank you. And I also just want to reiterate my joy <laughs> in experiencing this group of people, how uh, beautifully you listen to each other and, and just and the, how you expressed it yourselves also gives me, I mean, there's a there's a thing about you know men not being able to have feelings and have empathy and like here's an amazing group of men <laughs> that have have sat and listened to each other and expressed each express themselves with feeling and you know so I that's just a beautiful thing to experience I'm grateful for that yeah I'm grateful for you facilitating this just I can sit back and just enjoy <laughs> no responsibility very very delightful Lou thank you, thank you. <laughs> Anyone else want to express anything before we go? I would like to express gratitude as well. I, I really, really appreciate this time and this space, and, and you're all a bunch of wonderful people, and I, I really appreciate the time. Thank you. Likewise. Excellent. Okay. Well, we, we will um, announce a time for a facilitator's support circle, and you know maybe we'll see each other again then, and then... Edwin had invited people into the circle on Saturday, if you want to do that. And, um, and I have a circle tonight at seven and I'll be announcing other circles. We're trying to do this on a weekly basis. So, you know, try to get in as many circles as you can. And, and feel free to take this process and use it somewhere, you know, with people you know, too. Yeah, just like Lewis is doing, taking in the living room yes. conversations. That's great. So Absolutely. keep spreading it. Oh, one other thing I wanted to say. So we were recording this circle. The recording also includes this last, this bit of practice that we did where we were all expressing personal things. I don't know if anyone feels like what they expressed in that part they really don't want posted publicly anywhere. I don't know, David, how do people feel about that? No. Everyone's okay with that? It's all okay. Okay, all right. Okay. Just